Through life I come across quotes and sometimes the quotes kind of stick with me. For I'm never quite sure what the reason is, but, but I get quotes that kind of stick in my head. And some I've shared with my children. And if I were to say these right now and they were here, you'd see their eyes roll back in their head. Things like, life is not fair. And the other one my son especially used to love was, you can't outrun your consequences. Recently I came across a quote that got me thinking about my relationship to Jesus. Now I'm going to give you a small insight into how my brain works. Sometimes I can make a jump right to the correct answer, but for most of the time for me it's an arduous journey. As I've said to Gina many times, my mind can be a very scary place. And I'm thankful that I'm the only one with the help of the Lord that inhabits it. I was reading an article, and the author quoted the psychologist Carl Jung. The author stated that it wasn't a direct quote, but a distillation of a concept that Jung had brought forward in his writing. And the quote is, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. As I started, let that phrase roll around in my head, I started thinking about all the ideas we have and how they have people that support them. There are good ideas. There are bad ideas. You can't turn on the news without seeing an idea presented to you, especially if you turn into any of the news station. I'm going to give you some examples here, and I chose some of the better ideas, but there are many out there that are not so high and noble. We as Americans, one of the highest ideals is the preamble to our Constitution. It sets out an idea that many men and women have given their lives for. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberties to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That's touched people's lives. People have spent their entire life because of that one phrase. There's many others in the Constitution. There's the First Amendment, for a lot of us, there's the Second Amendment. I remember watching my son as a young boy. I think he was in the, had to be in the fifth grade. His sister is two years older, and she was going into the seventh grade. And in Redondo Beach, in the high school and then also in the middle school, they had the ROTC program. It's called Junior ROTC, J-R-R-O-T-C. And the one in Redondo Beach happened to be based on the Marine Corps. And she brought home a flyer for that Junior ROTC program. And she realized that, you know, she wasn't going to be much interested in it, but she left that flyer on the table, and my son picked that flyer up. And he started reading it and reading it. And he folded that thing up and he put it in his wallet. And he literally would take that out and it got to the point where that piece of paper was falling apart. He couldn't wait. The minute he went into middle school, he joined the, the Marine JROTC. He did two years in middle school, four years in high school. Two weeks after he graduated from high school, he went into the Marine Corps. That was 19 and a half years ago, 18 and a half years ago. No, 19 years ago, 19 years ago. Next July, he'll have his 20 years in as a Marine. That idea grabbed a hold of him when he was 12 years old.
Currently, the men and women's group are studying the book of Jeremiah. In the lesson this past week, there was a verse and a commentary quote that hit pretty hard on some of the ideas I've held in my life. In America, we have this idea of the self-made man, the rugged individual. If you're old enough, that was personified in an actor called named John Wayne. I don't know about you, but as a kid, that's who I wanted to be when I grew up. But I wanted to be a self-made man. I wanted not to depend on anybody to take care of myself. I was going to do it. Jeremiah 17.5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. In our lesson, there was a commentary. There was a quote from the book, Jeremiah and Lamentations from Sorrow to Hope by Philip Graham Ryken, focusing on this verse in 17.5. It said, This verse is a direct assault on American culture. It would be hard to imagine a statement that is more un-American, at least in the 21st century. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. In other words, anyone who trusts in technology, economics, psychology, medicine, the government, who will take good care of you, the military, the arts, or any other aspect of human culture is under God's curse. Yet these are exactly the things Americans trust in for meaning and security in life. If you were to pull out a dollar, it would say on it, in God we trust. But I think what Americans really mean is in self we trust. As I pondered this and I thought about how ideas have people, my thoughts turned to Christ. As I turned that quote over in my head and started to modify it, I started to try to make it personal in my life. I started with people or or believers, I meant, don't have Christ. Christ has believers. And I thought, well, that's, is that quite right? As I thought about it more, I came up with more of a question than a statement. And I remembered it from a study we did a few years ago called Not a Fan. That statement I came up with, it as a believer saved by the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus, I have Christ, but does Christ have me? Does Christ have me? I started thinking about what does that mean? What does that mean to belong to Christ? Just as my son was dedicated to that idea of being a Marine, how dedicated am I to Jesus Christ, to having, to Jesus having me? Let's look at the scripture here. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When we look at our lives, how our lives should be through the eyes of Christ, this verse is very specific on what our outlook should truly be. It says, it is no longer I who live. We died with Christ. Our faith is what accomplished this, our repentance and asking God to forgive us and accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. This is that part that I have Christ. He's my Savior. His sacrifice cleanses my life.
Then it goes on, it says, but Christ who lives in me. My life is not my own. I don't live for me, but I live for Christ who lives in me. Our lives should be lived in faith in the God, Son of God. We need to trust him, to walk with for him, and embrace his will as our own. Why? Because it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. I cannot die in Christ and live for myself. So how do you get to Christ living in you? There's a term used in several, by several New Testament writers, and it doesn't have a very top popular view or connotation, especially in today's society, in the heightened awareness and, and sensitivity that people have nowadays. You couldn't even really mention this word or talk about it without somebody getting upset. James chapter 1 says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul also uses the bond, term bondservant in Titus 1, and Peter uses it in 2 Peter 1. Bondservant. That's a nice term. But what does it really mean to be a bondservant? I go up, got my trusty Strong's Concordance, and I looked up that word. For you geeky people out there, that's Strong's number 1401. And it's Greek, and the word is doulos. And it's defined in, in the New Testament Greek lexicon as a slave, a bondman, a man of servitude condition. We don't like to use the term slave. It's a hard term. In the United States, in our country here, it brings up a lot of bad connotations. But that's exactly what Paul, James, Peter, they said they were to Christ. One of the other definitions says, devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. Devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. The world is not me, myself, and I as a believer. The world is Christ living in me. On its basic level, a bondservant is simply following your master to complete disregard of your own will, your own emotions, and your own desires. Christ, does Christ have you? To be a bondservant of Christ it means to complete and to utter devotion to God, to his word, to his will. It is disregarding your own desires and will in all things to lay your life at the cross and follow Christ. It doesn't have anything to do with being perfect, thank God. Yet it is a dedication to following God in all things. We are so blessed in our day and age. As I've studied Jeremiah, one of the comments around the, the table was that those people didn't have the Bible. You know, we're so blessed. I can carry a Bible as a book. 
I carry the Bible on my iPad. I carry the Bible on my phone. I think in my house, I counted 12 Bibles. And that's not counting the one I have on my, the two I have on my Kindle. We have the Word of God that gives us and guides us. A bondservant is to love as Christ loved, to walk as Christ walked. It means standing strong when you are weak and having nothing left. It means not letting up, not giving up, or putting up with anything less than a true and full relationship with God. Doing his will. Being a bond serpent is standing strong on the word of God while seeking God first above all else. Being a bond servant means taking responsibility for your own walk. Nobody else is going to do it for you. We take that responsibility through our own personal study of the word, through our personal prayer life, you take responsibility of that by being here tonight for a night of corporate prayer, to be able to get around in a circle and pray with each other. It's having faith in the best and worst of times, knowing that in the end, you belong to Christ. Being a bond servant means knowing only you can stand in the way of a deep and meaningful walk with God. The only thing that's blocking a deep and meaningful walk with God is your own dedication to seeking it out. If you let other things get in the way, you won't get there. If you decide that you'd rather spend Sunday morning playing a round of golf or going up to the lake or I guess we're getting into football season, catching the 27 games on Sunday. That's going to stand in your way of getting to know God, not being here in the fellowship. I'm always tickled when a pastor mentions about running into somebody he hasn't seen in church in a while in, uh, in Walmart and them going, blah, 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 stumbling over all the excuses. And It's your life. You can live it as you want. You can live it on your own or you can live it for God. It's your choice. It means you accept the responsibility of your walk and you bring everything you learn to God's word. I was reading that article, and I started thinking about that stuff, and it was a secular article, but when I started thinking about it, the first thing I did was take it to God's word. How does this apply to my life with God? Which led me to my message tonight. <laughs> uh, being a bond servant means not letting sin get you down. It means if you fall, you get up, you seek forgiveness, and you move, move on, learning what you can to do to let, not let it happen again. It's a dedication to purity and seeking that purity through a walk that spans your life. We all have decisions to make. I love the idea. I think it was Job said he made a covenant with God on his eyes. I think as men, especially, we need to make a covenant with God on our eyes. 
to make sure that our eyes aren't going where they don't belong. Seeking purity. The Apostle Peter, because he was a great one at rushing in and stumbling around, because of his history and relationship with Jesus, I think he had a great insight on when it comes encompass some of the essence of being a bondservant. If you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'd like to read 12 ver- verses 1 through 12 for you. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this reason, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not neglect to remind you always of these things though you know and are established in the present truth. Now that's a pretty heavy scripture. But it's filled with so much stuff, and there's so much stuff going on down there. Probably not going to be able to get into it all tonight because I really, really want to have us a t- give us a good time for prayer. But I'd like you guys to go back and look at that scripture later on. It addresses a lot of things about seeking a walk to be close to God. Verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seek the knowledge of God to keep continuing your studies of the Word. goes on to list qualities that all Christians should be actively trying to develop in their lives. The qualities listed below, I believe, are very important to be a bondservant. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. So I think there's a difference between being a Christian, a believer saved by Christ, and being a bondservant, a slave of Christ, to Christ. I started with the question, as a believer saved by the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus, I have Christ, but does Christ have me? As a Christian, I have Christ. I have admitted that I'm a sinner doomed to hell. I have accepted Christ Jesus as my and his atoning sacrifice and the Christ as a covering to all my sins. I'm saved and I get to spend eternity with Christ. Eternity in heaven. But as the Bema Seat movie we saw a few weeks ago, that gets you into heaven. But don't you want more than just a ticket to the gate, through the gate. Being a bondservant to me is about dedicating yourself to the mindset of Galatians 2.20. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe that scripture is the heart of a bondservant, a total dedication to faith in God, trusting in him, dedication to not giving up in your walk. And like I said before, if you fall, you get up, you ask for forgiveness, and you move on, and you learn from it. You don't stay in a pity party because you failed once. Most of all, it's seeking to make God's heart and will your own. This means love. Jesus' ministry was founded on love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love is and always should be our motivator. God's love is not our, not our own or the world's misguided love. I love when we have weddings here and the pastor is talking to the couple and he comes to 1 Corinthians 13. And he talks about the attributes of love. A love that puts others above ourselves. And he tells the, the bride and the groom to substitute their name for where it says love. I have to admit that's very convicting for me. I think it would be convicting for any of us. It's some high ideals to obtain, to strive towards. A love that is willing to give more than just a word of well-wishing, like James 2 talks about. A love that remembers those in need. And as I said before, the choice is yours on how far you want to go to serve Christ. Do you want that extra blessing of being a bondservant for Christ to where you live your life and everything you do, you think about in terms of what Christ thinks about it? Let's pray.